Starship's heat shield is a crisis that SpaceX still has to face, and this issue has become more crucial than ever as the fourth Starship flight is approaching, which will be a significant step in demonstrating Starship's ability to return to the Earth and be reused. So, what big solutions have SpaceX and Elon Musk implemented for Starship's heat shield to prepare for the upcoming launch? Let's find out in today's episode of Alpha Tech. A super reliable, light, reusable heat shield is the biggest technical challenge remaining for Starship. That's Elon's announcement about what Starship needs to be perfect. And indeed, the heat shield is the component that makes space enthusiasts like us worry. Why is that? If you're a big fan of SpaceX's Starship and frequently follow the intense tests of this gigantic spacecraft, I'm sure that you have seen heat shields falling off due to the strong vibrations from the formidable power of the Raptor engines. Of course, in reality, that happens a lot more than we think. Although at the time SpaceX has found ways to fix it, perhaps they had not truly focused on the heat shield because there were other components more noteworthy, such as engine issues or fuel pump systems, etc. It could also be because SpaceX hadn't really had the opportunity to put Starship into real impact scenarios, so the heat shield's endurance had not yet been fully demonstrated. Even when SpaceX conducted the first two Starship launches, the spacecraft did not reach orbit, so there were no subsequent developments. This means that SpaceX could not test how Starship's heat shields would function against re-entry. However, by the third Starship launch, IFT-3, SpaceX engineers finally recognized the serious problem with the heat shields when the spacecraft re-entered Earth's atmosphere. And this time, with the fourth flight, there won't be a bad ending like before because SpaceX and Elon Musk have made upgrades to fix this issue, promising a better outcome for the flight. As we knew before sitting on top of Booster 11, Ship 29 was set aside by SpaceX for an entire month to examine the heat shield tiles thoroughly. In the end, the new heat shield tiles on the nose cone of Ship 29 were assessed to be somewhat different from the previous tiles, demonstrating a change in SpaceX's technology. When it comes to heat shields, the main concerns are adhesion, heat resistance, lightness, and reusability. However, the core issue that we must ensure first and foremost is the adhesion of the heat shield tiles. Just one broken or fallen tile and the effects of the heat shield will then be meaningless. Tiles falling off can result from vibrations causing the heat shields to collide with their edges, leading to cracks and ultimately falling off. To solve this problem, increasing the distance between the tiles beyond the range of vibration motion could be beneficial. This adjustment might require changing the shape of the tiles, making them protrude more like a pyramid shape. By increasing the height of the tiles, the plasma flow could be disturbed further away from the spacecraft's body potentially minimizing damage. Additionally, increased surface roughness could help optimize hydrodynamics, similar to the rough skin of a shark. Flow simulations can be used to calculate the optimal roughness height to enhance aerodynamic performance. Reducing the size of the tiles could address the issue of heat-resistant tiles. This approach acknowledges the challenges posed by acoustic reflection of the explosions and vibrations transmitted from the launch pad and testing. Smaller tiles, especially at joints on the vehicle, could alleviate the vibration problem at these critical joints. Additionally, integrating a water cooling system into the setup could provide even more solutions. Moreover, there is speculation regarding the mounting pins possibly causing tiling cracks under pressure. The sharpness of these pins and the compressive strength of the insulation layer beneath the tiles raise concerns. Although there is an insert inside the tiles, questions remain about whether it provides enough surface area to distribute the load adequately. Therefore, SpaceX's focus has shifted to upgrading the attachment process rather than the tiles themselves, as they seem structurally sound. Addressing issues with the attachment mechanism could provide a more effective solution to the challenges faced by the thermal protection system. This includes refining the mounting pins and enhancing the metal pins SpaceX has used additionally. Typically, thermal tiles are attached via standard-sized thinner metal pins. SpaceX has changed the type of adhesive used to bond the heat shields. Although SpaceX hasn't disclosed any information about this, it's evident that the team has switched from a blue tile glue to a new red glue. All these efforts were aimed at ensuring the tiles remain securely attached under extreme mechanical and thermal pressure during re-entry. So, why doesn't SpaceX agree to only use glue or metal pins on the whole Starship rocket? It sounds like they're using a combination. As we know, the nose cone and leading wing edges of the Starship rocket play crucial roles in its aerodynamics, thermal protection, and overall performance during the atmospheric entry and flight. The use of metal pins in these areas could disrupt the aerodynamic profile of the spacecraft, leading to increased drag during atmospheric entry. Adhesive bonds create a smoother surface, minimizing aerodynamic disturbances and optimizing the spacecraft's performance during re-entry. Additionally, the adhesive helps distribute heat more evenly across the surface of the heat shield tiles, 
enhancing their thermal protection capabilities during re-entry into the Earth's atmosphere. It also helps prevent hot gases from penetrating between the tiles in the spacecraft structure, reducing the risk of heat damage. But is there any reason not to use glue on the entire prototype? Applying glue to the entire front surface of the ship would be time-consuming affect serviceability due to cracking, and require more fuel to run the cooling system, which would increase the spacecraft's mass. Although Starship's TPS is highly estimated by its advanced technology, as usual, SpaceX still has to face the matter of the connection between the star brick and the vehicle's body. Talking about this, one hypothesis is given as follows. SpaceX modeled its heat shield tiles after the highly porous space shuttle tiles, originally developed back in the early 70s. They were a space-age material at the time, but were problematic even back then. Attaching them securely has been very difficult since the days of the space shuttle program. They're so porous and low density that they can carry very little load. Bolting them onto the vehicle is out of the question. Even worse, SpaceX's approach using the smooth pins. NASA used epoxy-like silicone adhesive impregnated in a soft, squishy felt layer between the undersurface of the tiles and the vehicle's fuselage. This clever approach was aimed at maximizing the surface area of attachment of each tile. Hundreds of shuttle tiles still fell off after each mission, mostly after re-entry. Fortunately, they were mostly missing in the aft of the vehicle, where they had the least adverse effect. It appears SpaceX relies on metal pins, resulting in a much smaller relative surface area coming in contact with the tiles. Poking holes in the back of the tiles to accommodate the pins doesn't help them maintain strength. Despite the numerous challenges the Starship team faces in perfecting its thermal protection system, TPS, it's undeniable that Starship's TPS benefits greatly from NASA's space shuttle technology while also addressing and improving upon its weaknesses. Starship is engineered for rapid reusability, allowing it to land, undergo a quick inspection, be remounted on the launch vehicle, and return to space promptly. This necessitates a highly reliable insulating shield, as it wouldn't be feasible to replace the entire TPS after each mission. The closest parallel to this technology can be seen in the heat tiles used on the space shuttle. Both Starship and Space Shuttle feature black heat shield tiles, despite the intuitive idea that whiter reflective coatings would be better at reflecting heat. This is because the main heat threat during re-entry comes not from sunlight, but from plasma shockwave created when the spacecraft slams into the atmosphere at hypersonic speeds. During re-entry, temperatures below the spacecraft can soar to 2300 degrees Fahrenheit or 1260 degrees Celsius. The black appearance of the shuttle tiles actually comes from a coating of borosilicate glass, known for its low thermal expansion coefficient. White tiles are used in less heat-intensive areas, providing optimal thermal properties while in orbit. NASA's shuttle program encountered significant issues with its TPS, such as difficulties in bonding the tiles to the hull and instances of tiles getting loose during launch. These problems, along with the extensive maintenance required between flights, tarnished the shuttle's reputation for rapid reusability. Some of these features had catastrophic consequences, offering important lessons for future spacecraft, including SpaceX's Starship and Sierra Space's Dream Chaser. Unlike the shuttle, which was mounted on the side of its external tank and thus vulnerable to impacts from foam and ice debris, Starship's design positions the upper stage atop the lower stage, avoiding this specific risk. Additionally, the shuttle's complex structure required a variety of thermal tile shapes, making the replacement process cumbersome and costly. In contrast, Starship employs a simplified design with just two main types of heat shield tiles, thinner and thicker star bricks. Now we understand how complex the heat shield of a spacecraft truly is. Hopefully, in the upcoming launch, SpaceX will not disappoint us with a strong re-entry to Earth of Starship. I am eagerly looking forward to this, and hopefully you are too. All of us want Starship to return to Starbase grandly, but the path to that vision is indeed not easy. Even Elon Musk has indicated this. I think we'll want to have uh, at least two consecutive successes of a given design uh, that uh, land at a specific point in the ocean or smash into a specific point in the ocean before we try to bring it back to the launch site. So, how will SpaceX and Elon Musk make the Starship splash down in the sea? Why doesn't SpaceX land Starship on a drone ship like Falcon 9? As we all know, Starship has gone through three explosive launches, but what SpaceX has gained is invaluable. These can be considered foundational launches according to SpaceX's development plan, and this will not significantly hinder the goal SpaceX is about to achieve. For the fourth launch of Starship, as outlined by CEO Elon Musk, uh, We'll get through the high heating regime um, and uh, s smash into the ocean at a controlled spot. SpaceX will test launch the super-heavy spacecraft into orbit, and it will attempt to land on a virtual tower. 
This means that in reality, Starship and Super Heavy will have to perform a controlled landing on the ocean. The spacecraft will hover precisely over a specific point in the ocean until it runs out of fuel and then falls down. This method will indeed bring many advantages for SpaceX. The clearest evidence of this is what they did when practicing landing the Falcon 9 rocket on a drone ship at sea. They had to try several times before they were confident enough to perform it on a real drone. So how will Elon Musk and SpaceX execute this landing in the fourth launch? Why don't they land Starship on a drone ship but instead let it splash down in the water? The decision to opt for a splashdown landing for SpaceX's orbital Starship mission stands in stark contrast to the company's track record of triumphant landings achieved with previous ventures. SpaceX has gained acclaim for its adeptness at gently touching down Falcon 9 first stage rockets on their landing legs since 2015, and even accomplishing this delicate feat with a massive Starship prototype at the Starbase Texas facility. This peculiar departure from routine might raise eyebrows, considering SpaceX's established proficiency in pinpoint landings. There are several good reasons for this decision. Well, if you're wondering why spaceships in orbit aren't trying to land on a starbase in Texas, let me be clear that the first and most important for this reason is, of course, human safety. One of these tests is the belly flop maneuver, which involves the spacecraft flipping over and re-entering the Earth's atmosphere with its belly facing downwards. This allows for a controlled descent and landing, similar to how a skydiver would land. To simulate the conditions of this maneuver, SpaceX has decided to drop the Starship into the sea. This will allow them to test the spacecraft's ability to control its descent and landing, as well as its structural integrity when subjected to the forces of re-entry. This is because the orbital landing test flights did not start with nearly straight up and down trajectories like the first prototype test flights. Even those trajectories were much more difficult than those of the engines. When the spacecraft was flying sideways and using full orbital speed, to be safe on re-entry, you need to re-enter the atmosphere somewhere on the other side of the ocean. If something goes wrong, it'll cause problems for the experimental spacecraft with the following experimental systems. Thus, his new thermal protection system will put us in the same position that we found ourselves in during the 2003 Space Shuttle Columbia disaster, where spacecraft barrels have leaked all over the United States. We don't want that to happen again, and they'll try to dismantle this orbital spaceship prototype. After devising a new plan for Starship, SpaceX has carefully considered landing the Super Heavy in the Gulf of Mexico. The rotating part of the plane passes over the ocean on a trajectory that ensures all debris will fall into the ocean in case something goes wrong. The last splash point is a safe distance in the Indian Ocean. Although this location is not under U.S. jurisdiction where SpaceX can freely recover the spacecraft, it's the best way to ensure human safety and increase the success rate of Starship. Furthermore, the wisdom behind opting for a water landing for Starship encompasses more than merely averting human impact and collecting data. The nurturing embrace of water offers a gentle cushion, a welcoming medium that absorbs a significant portion of the impact forces. It's the secret behind the concept of a soft landing. Hence, when Starship descends into the sea, should the descent be controlled and guided, it's nearly certain that the structural integrity of Starship will remain largely intact, enabling SpaceX to swiftly facilitate its recovery. The innate softness of the ocean functions akin to a natural shock absorber, shielding the spacecraft from the unyielding forces of re-entry. Another pivotal reason SpaceX refrains from catching Starship midair, akin to Mechazilla, is tied to the preservation of ground infrastructure safety. Candidly speaking, Starship remains within the realm of experimentation, necessitating further tests before it aligns with Elon Musk's envisioned blueprint. The consequences would be remarkably perilous if they were to attempt mid-air capture during the initial launch, be it the first, second, or even the third attempt. For instance, any additional hardware surrounding the launch pad would experience substantial setbacks if compromised. It's fair to assert that perhaps SpaceX's confidence in landing Falcon 9 prompted several iterations wherein both vehicles autonomously navigated a shared path using grid fins and thrust vectors, ensuring their return to the landing site. However, there's little doubt that Starship is an entirely different beast, a behemoth that is bound to yield surprises. Just consider the inaugural launch of Starship with Super Heavy, ignited by the fiery combustion of 33 Raptor engines, generating nearly 17 million pounds of thrust, resulting in a considerable excavation on the launch pad. Additionally, SpaceX has explored the augmentation of engine thrust to nearly 19 million pounds. This staggering magnitude is truly terrifying. So what transpires if complications arise? To what extent could the damages manifest, especially given the colossal mass of Super Heavy upon touchdown? That is also the question in the case of Starship landing on a drone ship like the Falcon 9. When it's near vacant interior, except for a small amount of remaining propellants specifically reserved for landing burns, 
In my perspective, the most significant apprehension pertains to the possibility of the boosters veering off course and causing irreparable destruction to the launch tower or gantry. With its tremendous velocity and substantial mass upon descent, it holds potential for grave insurmountable damages. It's a shame to see the tower destroyed in this way, even if SpaceX is now building three to four more Starship launch towers. Two launch towers at the Cape as well, so we'll have four launch towers for Starship probably by sometime next year. So we're aiming to have the first CAPES launch tower and launch system operational around the middle of next year, and that'll be important for launch that are sort of fly over land. Elon Musk said at a presentation in early 2024, The reality is increasingly approaching us as the progress of the second tower at Starbase and the Starbuttle launch tower on Florida is developing very strongly. At the second OLM construction site, workers dismantled suborbital pad B in the suborbital tank farm itself. Many piles have been installed. The teams have deployed Section 7 to the Sanchez site with Sections 1, 2, 3, and 6 at Brownsville Port, Sections 8 and 9 at the Sanchez site, and Sections 4 and 5 still at Roberts Road in Cape Canaveral. According to FAA documents regarding the proposal for the Starbase 2 integration tower, the tower will be placed in a square corresponding to the piles that SpaceX had previously deployed. As for the launch tower at LC-39A in Florida, SpaceX previously completed the tower with two chopstick arms. They also built the launch pad, but only with six cylindrical legs for the launch mount at that time. After a period of inactivity, in recent months, SpaceX has started particularly significant reforms that make it unpredictable what they're planning to do there. Keeping the launch tower intact, SpaceX has leveled the entire launch pad. Let's wait for the next developments in the story. It will certainly not disappoint us. However, regardless of what SpaceX does, they'll definitely put this launch tower into operation by mid-2025, as Elon Musk has stated. By then, Starship will certainly be able to be caught by Mechazilla smoothly. Because if the fourth and fifth Starship launches can splash down in a specific location and retain hardware, then on the sixth flight, SpaceX can catch Starship with Mechazilla. All three launches will certainly take place this year, possibly even more, as they've submitted applications to the FAA to request additional launches, potentially reaching six to nine launches. Elon Musk has also suggested that the success rate of catching up with Mechazilla Tower is 80 to 90 percent this year. After all, until SpaceX has enough launch towers, four in total, tested and operational, combined with Starship being reliable enough, Elon Musk's dream will no longer be a distant thing. That's all for today's episode. Thank you so much for watching and see you next time.